Welcome to this episode of Humanity of the Podcast. Uh, this is Emilio. Uh, today I'd like to take a few moments to speak about the idea of lecturing, discussion, and debate. For some people this may seem remedial, but I think it's an important thing to have a conversation about because they are all different. They're all different things. And each of them feel good in different ways. I should say, to me at least. Some people don't like any. I think that's something that as our human interactions are in flux right now, that we need to remember that not everyone has the same capacity for human interaction as others. Mine is pretty infinite. My ability to just, like, interact with people day in, day out, meet strangers. But that's a skill. I had to I had to build that. I had to create that. And I have a lot of thank uh, to, to my degree programs that uh, were here at the University of Nebraska. at both my undergraduate and my graduate degree in social work. And one of the skills I didn't realize that I lacked when I first started was just how to interact with people. Now that might sound strange because we all interact with people, right? Well, it's not really that simple. I want you to think of the last 10 people that you interacted with. What was the time frame between when you interacted with those people? So I'll give you an example. Here is uh, the last 10 people I interacted with. Last person, last human being I interacted with is I got breakfast from somewhere. I dropped my partner off at work uh, and I decided, you know, it's, it's Friday. I'm going to stop and uh, I, I don't feel like making my normal eggs right now. So I'm just going to stop and get breakfast somewhere. So I interacted with the person who was working there. Now rate that interaction. And I want you to use these three metrics. How close did you feel to that person? How friendly did you feel that person was to you? And how likely would you be to, to want to interact with that person again as soon as possible? So this last, this last person um, that I interacted with, uh, how friendly were they? Pretty friendly. Pretty nice, but in a very customer service way. How likely would I want to be to interact with that person again? Uh, I'm in no rush. Really. I'm in, I'm in no rush, really. And then for the overall of it, I'd say I'd rate that um, three, out of, 3 out of 10, not because it was unpleasant, but because I'm trying to measure on how meaningful it was to me. So not very meaningful. Okay. I'm not going to do that for all 10 people, but just keep in mind uh, of those things if you want to go and do this for yourself. So person I interacted before that, uh, my partner. So obviously someone I feel very close to who ranks very high on all the things that I spoke of before. Um, cause I feel very close to her. Okay, so how long between those two? Uh, 10 minutes, maybe. Now the last person I interacted before that was uh, my neighbor. So I was letting uh, my dog out and I saw the neighbor, and we we just exchanged pleasantries, and we engaged in social banter. I think uh, what happened is uh, my dog started following her in the beginning, and I joked. I said, "Hey, do you want, do you want to go to work?" And she joked back because uh, I was talking to my dog. She joked back, "Oh no, you don't want to do that." Friendly banter. So, not overall meaningful, but pleasant. Take a step all the way back to yesterday night, since the last person I saw. I saw my brother and his girlfriend, um, and we were watching uh, TV and just kind of hanging out, talking, catching up. Pretty, pretty pleasant. So what I get to, to notice is that I've had pretty pleasant interactions with humans lately, and that's pretty typical for me. Most interactions I have with humans are pleasant 
most face-to-face -face interactions. When I don't have pleasant interactions, it's usually over the internet. And I try not to engage in those. Because uh, Socrates has a quote, and I don't want to super, super misquote him. Um, because the last time I remember hearing someone say this, I think I was in high school, but uh, it says from from debate come uh, from debate comes the truth or something uh, uh, along that along that line. But maybe I'm misquoting him. Sorry, Socrates. Uh, <laughs> um, or maybe that's just one of those things that is not true. That's out there that people said that he said, which is common also. But anyway. I like to think of debate as let's pu let's put my ideas against your ideas and let's see whose ideas have more merit. But that is not how debates often go. It's usually the person who is more charismatic, who has more clever lines, uh, who is more personable that people tend to believe. Because... Facts are less fun, less pleasant, uh, harder to, to grapple with. So what I'm trying to say is that a lot of this debates that I see is really people spinning their wheels. We're not making a lot of progress. We're running, we're kind of entrenching ourselves in a circle. And I say this not as someone, as, as a casual observer, uh, if you haven't heard me before, you know, I've been I've been engaged in these types of uh, intentional dialogues, exchanges of ideas, things like that for the last fifteen years of my life. Um, I just got off the off the phone. I had to leave a message because I didn't get it back. But I'm trying to partner with uh, a local college here to to run some series of getting people together just to talk um, and have those meaningful dialogues. So what I will say is that. Uh, in some ways, I'm thrilled to see people finally coming together and like putting their ideas against each other. But what I what I also say is that a lot of people haven't done their homework. Um, so in, in when someone hasn't done their homework, the in lieu of meaningful discussion, we get people lobbing personal insults and things that sound good to people that already agree with you. Uh, here's a rule of public speaking that that I've heard and I've told a lot of people a lot: the 20, 20, 80, 20 rule. Twenty people. 20% of people in the room probably love you. They're, they're already on board. The, that is your fan base. They, they like you. 20% probably hates you. They don't agree with what you're saying. They, they're not going to agree with what you're saying. They don't like you. 80% is somewhere in the middle in there. So the question is, who do you cater to? Because if you cater to the people that you love, then this is not an exchange of ideas. This is a rally. If you cater to the people that that don't like you already, then this is not exchanges ideas. This is a, uh, a competition, really, um, or a debate. If you cater to the people in the middle, then the, then both of the other people on, on the uh, wings are going to be upset with you for not doing enough. So there is no winning in this. The best way I heard it is that when leading these conversations... The best thing is to be almost invisible. That you're not there. You are a helping hand in this, but you are not the show. And I don't know. Uh, I was just telling my my brother's girlfriend yesterday because uh, she she didn't know about she doesn't know me in, in my past jobs or what I've done and. She, she said, you're very good at being like, I can feel like I can ask you any question, and you feel very kind and gentle, but really knowledgeable about the subject. And I said, well, it's because I've, I've been having these conversations for a long time. Um, conversation about race, conversation about immigration, conversation about gender, conversation about all those things. I've been... I've met literally thousands of people. So here, here's a fun fact about me. I help, um, I used to volunteer for, and then I worked for an organization that helped rent a camp. And so I did 38 of camps that were either 72 hours long over a weekend or that were a week long, uh, getting um, 30 to 60 teenagers uh, together just to talk about 
hard issues. And I, I did most of them here, but I did one of them in Arkansas. Um, and so if you want to calculate the hours, one, one time I did it, but it was about halfway through, and it was like I had spent half a year doing that. So I've literally met, I'm bad at math, but hundreds of people, thousands maybe, or over a thousand, I'm, I'm really bad. Because beyond just those um, camps, I've also done other workshops, things like that. And what I can say is that from where I've been, and it, I, it was mostly around the Midwest, so uh, a lot of Nebraska, um, Rosebud, Pine Ridge, uh, uh, Table Table Rock Reservations in, in South Dakota, I did some work on there. I've been down to, to Kansas, uh, over to Iowa, like I said, I did some in, in Arkansas. I've been around. And what I can tell you is that when you get face-to-face -face with people about these things... Most people don't really know where to go with these conversations. But the people who have really strong convictions about a position, they're usually loosely held. Regardless of whether I agree with these people or not, but if you start pushing anyone in any of their positions, uh, they're usually pretty loosely held. Now, not everyone. Some people get a position and they stick with it. And for some people, that's commendable. But sometimes... I've encountered where it's just factually wrong. And um, sometimes it's factually wrong in ways that like shock people in the room. I used to have a bit in one of my, because uh, what I what I do for things is I would give a, a brief presentation and then I'd be like, all right, let's have a conversation about what I just had. And so um, in these presentations, one thing would be, uh, I had a thing of where I said, now what president is the only president to, to own a Quran. And someone pointed to a picture of Barack Obama on there. She quietly pointed to it, right? And I said, oh, it, it was Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jeff Jefferson also took all the references to mysticism out of, uh, out of the New Testament and called it the life and teachings of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But what should I have done in that situation? Should I have stopped and said, no, you idiot, you're racist, you're terrible, you're you're bigoted, etc., etc. No, um, because that would have derailed everything of where we were going. In some ways, it was a teaching moment for everyone without needing to call attention to it. Because, let's say I would have stopped and done that to that person. Would it have felt good for me? Nah, Maybe. Not not really, you know, but I can understand for some people who, who want to do that, but I'm just not, I'm not aggressive in that type of way. But that person knew what had happened, and the people around knew what had happened, and I knew what had happened. So I figured, oh, point made, keep moving. Um, so was I right or wrong? What I'll tell you is that when you, when one has, I, I'd, I'd love, I'd love for any of you to feel what it's like to be in front of a room full of people having that type of conversation. Not the first time you've had it, not the second time you've had it, but maybe the third or fourth time you've had a conversation like that in uh, two weeks. This stuff is not rocket science to me. I've... I've seen this build and grow. And I'll tell you that I... Uh, a lot of these people, it's like, oh, the, the mystery of, of the Trump voter. I, I've worked with probably some of the people who voted. I worked with them when they were teenagers. Uh, when I was young, you know. Um, it's not... It's not a mystery to me who these people are. Now, if you want me to pass judgment on them, case by case basis, really, and that's uh, pragmatism talking, it'd be easy to dismiss and say, everyone who likes Donald Trump, I 100% hate. But it wouldn't be true. Um, I have a... Um, not not an immediate family member, but I have an extended family member who's an older gentleman. Um, so you can't see me, but I'm definitely Mexican-American. And uh, 
so are they, and they voted for they voted for Trump. And I remember my my mother telling me this, and I was like, "Wow, why?" And my mother told me, "Well, he believed all the he believed the jobs talk that he's going to bring back jobs, and this is." And I said, "Like, well, I I wonder." And we're not close enough to have that conversation, that frank conversation, but maybe one day we will. I wonder what he's feeling now. Um, so I know some people probably listen to this are just like, who cares? You know, who cares what people like that uh, think and feel? Um, I used to work in a, in a group home for teenagers who come from drug and alcohol addiction. And sometimes I do double shifts, right? So I'd, I'd be there for from gosh six six in the morning to eleven o'clock at night and I learned that you can care about people and wish the best for them and disagree with everything that they say and also know that you can't trust them. This is I guess what people call um I hate using the frame because I'm not, I'm not trying to say that these people are the devil, but it's called sympathy for the devil, right? It's how can you feel bad for someone that would never feel bad for you? How would you do that? I don't know. It's just how I am. I I can disagree with someone and see where they're, where they're coming from. But it doesn't mean I have to agree with them. I can think they're completely wrong. But I can I can empathize with how they came to, to those conclusions. But, sorry, if you can hear in the background, you can hear my dog who, who wants desperately to be in here. <laughs> um, so, let's, let's keep moving on with the idea of what creates meaningful dialogue. Meaningful dialogue is built on good faith arguments, which is if I assert something, I mean it. And I'm doing it because I want a good response. I want a meaningful response. I want to exchange ideas. So let's let's take uh, something that's been in the news and let's see if we can make a good faith argument and a bad faith argument. Um, let's take the the Strzok hearing yesterday. Uh, Strzok? Strzok? Uh, hearing yesterday in front of Congress. So if the assertion that people were making of this FBI agent who was caught... Uh, and dismissed from from the Mueller uh, probe because of what they thought were biased um, text messages, personal text messages uh, that were that were leaked out. Um, good faith argument would be, Mr. Schrock, please come here and um, tell us why you did this. And if there's anything that looks amiss, I would like to give you uh, a chance to to say it. So. Um, instead, let me see if I can, if I can play Strzok, a clip. On March the 14th, 2017, I think we're, what, a couple of months into the presidency? See if you uh, can recall this text that you uh, received. Finally, two pages away from finishing ATPM. Do you know the president resides in the end? What is ATPM? I believe it's a reference to the book All the President's Men. All right. Do you recall how you reply? Uh, generally, I feigned surprise and uh, said something to the effect that we should be so lucky or fortunate. No, it was lucky. Um, lucky in what way? Uh, sir, am I that he would uh, resign as president? You wanted him to resign two months into his presidency? Sir, my sense was uh, in a personal belief that I was not pleased with the direction and things that were being done with the presidency. I thought you trusted the American people. I, I thought that was what you said in August of 2016, that the American people would stop him, and then they didn't stop him. And here so we I, are in I, March. I, okay. Here is why this is a bad faith argument. Uh, Trey Gowdy, who you, who you heard speaking, uh, was a congressman and... It's a bad faith argument because he already knows what he wants Mr. Strzok to say. He's trying to trap him into saying something. This is not a discussion. This is a, this is a setup. Because not interested in hearing what the response is, but more interested 
in being able to use those words as weapons against uh, someone. So you, you may have seen this in your own personal life. I want you to think about that. Well, how that makes you feel. Most people would feel uh, belittled, attacked. Uh, feels kind of unfair. Feels like not someone you'd like to keep having a conversation with. So we get to uh, the last thing I want to talk about for these last 10 minutes, which are arguments. So that is when all decorum has has fallen away. All the idea that we're here to exchange ideas, that we're here to um, enjoy each other's companies and, and foster ideas so they can grow. Arguments are, I'm going to try to say things to hurt you, to shut you down, or to disengage. We, as a public, right now, are arguing. Having an argument. So, and you've probably heard me say about other things. We either... We're either going to have a clean break, meaning that everyone's going to go back to their own camps. No one's going to resolve anything. We're going to move, and we're just going to move on. We are going to come together in certain spaces and have good faith conversations and we're going to try to find middle ground or we're going to continue to escalate arguments. Um, and when people escalate arguments, it's not the best ideas that win. It's who who either uh, is able to drive their uh, opponent into submission or who can undermine the other person so that no one wants to listen to, to them. I'm sure there's a few other scenarios. But we, we see all of this happening right now. I have a good friend. I think I talked about him last time. And he, did, he stated the other day, uh, you know, I just don't, I don't watch the news. And some people see that as a virtue. And I can't tell you whether it is or not, but I will tell you that I, I personally read the news. I personally try to stay informed because I want to be aware of the things that are around me. I'm, I'm kind of an information gatherer. I like, to, I like to be in the know about things. But my friend saw it as a virtue also of that, like, well, I don't have to carry the weight of the bad news that happens. And I told him... Well, you're very lucky that you don't think that any of these things are going to personally affect you. What are you saying to, to someone in that position who you have a close relationship with that you just disagree in that type of situation with? And that's what I said. Uh, and he said, you know, I'm not the type of person to go out and do these things, but I'll always be here for you to, like, help help you feel at home, help you relax, help you do that. And that is another skill. If you're looking right now for your for your place in like, what am I supposed to be doing in life? I feel like the world is kind of just out of whack and what, what, am, I, what am I supposed to do? Everyone has skills. Just find which, which you have and um, give some of that time to people who don't deserve it. <laughs> I guess that's the best way I could I could say it. And I say don't deserve it. Maybe that's some salt that I just have. Um, but I'll tell you that like this work that, and as I've mentioned before, I've been doing it for a long time. It is it is thankless work. It is it is completely thankless work. Uh, there's not a ton of money inside of it. If you're doing it right, people are gonna dislike you because you're uh, you're kicking up sand, um, or maybe. I don't like that metaphor. Let's let's say that you're you're the truth is like staring into the sun. It doesn't feel good and if you do it long enough you're going to go blind, but it is where energy comes from. I'm I'm a big believer in truth. And that we should always be in the pursuit of truth.
so for those of you who are like me and you like truth, what can we do? Well, I'll, I'll keep saying until I'm blue in the face, get media literate. If you have a chance, like even on a just, – just any way you can, listen to, to different people's ideas that they're putting out there, not just the ones you agree with. Listen to people that you disagree with because these are your neighbors, whether you like it or not. Whether you like these people or not, you're you're in a closed system. You're on a planet. You're not getting off of this planet uh, away from them. Now you can you can find your strongholds and hold yourself up in there. And some people will, and some people do. And I can't say whether that's good or bad. It just is, um, especially in more insular cultures. But there's always going to be people like me who want to go out and meet different people and have uh, meaningful interactions with people that that are different and i i've met dozens of people like this uh in my time um in this field that are similar so if you're like me you're a um cultural cosmonaut i'd like to invite you come come along come with me i'm i'm here i just want to See what there is out there. See who there is out there. If I disagree with them, fine. If I argue with them, well, it's, it's not it's not the worst thing in the world. I've had plenty of arguments in my life. If we make new friends, that's great. If we find that the world is brighter than we thought, that's great. If we find that the, the world is darker than we anticipated, then get up and fight. That's, that's really all I can say. Uh... Maybe not as a directive, but I'm I'm getting up and I'm fighting. So I invite you come come with me if you'd like to do that. Um, I I've been meaning to for gosh two years now on on this podcast and my last one to like try to get all my thoughts out about um, Antifa and violence as a means to peace. Um. I actually know a couple people like I've I've met I maybe know is a strong word I've met a couple people I know that run in those Antifa circles and um I've been thinking of interviewing one of them I have one in particular I think uh people who advocate crime in any way some people shy away from because it's like oh my god I can't believe that but like bleh. <laughs> I grew up around people who have done crime and not just grew up around like I'm a social worker, so I interviewed for for a position at the um, at the prison here at the men's prison uh, here in town uh, before I took the job uh, at the high school I'm at. Uh, so I could have easily been inside of there. And really, what it boils down to is like you're you are a human, you're a human being, and as a human being, you are equipped with choices, and these are the choices you made. The society that we're in right now deems that because you made these choices that we're going to put you in a cage um, or that we're going to fine you an amount of currency. Uh, so in a way, they're still, they're still a human. They are just caught up in a different system than I am right now. Uh, and uh, with the Antifa people, again, like I said before, uh, with other people, Maybe I agree with some things they do. Maybe I don't. But at the end of the day, I empathize why they they think their methods are the the correct methods. I think I'll have that conversation for sure. All right. Well, hey, guys and gals and everyone else. I have some real exciting stuff coming up here. This is hopefully you're listening to this as a as a backlog because um, I'm I'm going to try to take this stuff to the next level. Uh, so thank you everyone. If you get a chance, please follow us facebook.com slash humanity the podcast on Twitter at humanity the pod. Uh, if you'd be so kind, head over to our Patreon and um, help me fund this. This is patreon.com uh, slash humanity the podcast. Uh, hopefully I have great news for you in the near future. All right, everyone. Happy Friday. Have a good one.